everyone. Thanks so much for joining us here on Go Local Live in the Navigant Credit Union Broadcast Center. I'm Molly O'Brien. It is Monday, April 9th, and today we're kicking off the show with Robin Garceau of Robin Garceau Interiors. Thanks so much for joining us. Hi, Molly. Hey, it's so good to see you. You're back in action, and we're talking about quality and design. And Robin, you have a big trip coming up. You're headed to High Point, North Carolina, where you're going to be talking about, again, quality and design. Tell us a little bit about your trip coming up. Well, uh, I have a couple events coming up this month as well as today, and both are about speaking about quality and home design. So I thought it would be really good to cross that subject today as well. Um, next weekend, I'll be attending High Point, North Carolina, International Home Furnishings Market, and I've been asked to speak with several industry members there about this subject. And then on the 28th, I'll be hosting an event with artists Anthony Tomaselli and Bill Lane at the Providence Art Club at the Dodge House there and speaking about quality and design as well. So I, again, I thought today would be a perfect opportunity to talk about those things. What I think is so cool is you're obviously an expert in the subject. You're good at what you do, but you're sharing that knowledge with others and giving people some insight into mm -hmm. what's happening in the world of design because you're always out there learning what's new, what's on trend, and what is, you know, the classics, obviously. Um, this event, so, so you're headed to High Point to, to talk, and then you're also having this event coming up April 28th, later on in the month at the Providence Art Club. And this is kind of like a designer's day, uh, so, but all different kinds of designers and makers, which I think is so neat. Um, you're kind of hosting the event. You're kind of one of the, the, the main people. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you'll be talking about? Sure. It will be about art and design. It will be about quality in products and things that we're looking for. About art and what the story is behind art. And getting back to really the putting beautiful art in our homes. How we use it as a design um, factor, and it doesn't necessarily have to match the sofa. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily have to go with the paint that you have. It just speaks to you. What does it mean? What's the story about it? And do will you love seeing it all the time? I was in a house in Maine yesterday. Oh. I'm doing a house Picture on the you water posted. there. Yeah. Yeah, <gasps> so I'll be um, working on that. <laughs> and she had this absolutely beautiful antique wood mantle oh. on her um, for a fireplace mantle. And what did she have above it? A TV. Yeah. So I looked at her and I said, are you going to be watching TV all the time in here? Like, is that what you want over this gorgeous fireplace? And she said, no, we really don't even watch it. I said, well, maybe we could put a beautiful piece of artwork there because that's something that you want to look at every day. You don't need to have it, a TV over your fireplace everywhere. This was in her master bedroom. It was beautiful. To me, that's what you want to do. You want to make your rooms beautiful and let the art speak to you. So that's what we'll be talking about on the 28th. Um, Anthony Tomaselli is you know, a well-known local artist. He's great. Um, and Bill Lane is a watercolor artist, and he's fantastic as well. Uh, Providence Art Club is just a great place to go in and browse and look. So we're going to have a great day that day. I think it's so cool, too, what a great idea to be able to incorporate different, not only industries, but different makers and different people who probably collaborate all of the time and get everybody together talking and um, inspiring each other. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a good networking day and just yeah. meeting and greeting and it's open to the public. And um, I always like to brainstorm with other designers and artists and what they're doing and and staying up on trends. So it's really going to be exciting. I think what a neat opportunity. So if you're interested, uh, we'll have some details as well, including the date set, but it's Saturday, April 28th. April 28th from 12 to 4. From 12 to 4. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about our topic today is um, pursuing quality of design. So quality in design. Uh, and we talked a little bit about this here and there throughout mm -hmm. our conversations. Um, but really kind of getting to that point of how our society has become kind of a throwaway society. Mm -hmm. uh, and really you want to get back to that 
finding quality products and that kind of thing. Can you talk to us about how we got to this point, Robin? You know, when I, I still remember the day that this fabric came in to where I was working in the design firm, and it was a polyester knockoff of this beautiful embroidered silk fabric. And I looked at it, and of course it was less expensive, and it looked kind of like the fabric, but I couldn't believe that, you know, okay, now we have this beautiful embroidered silk, and that this is a polyester knockoff of an embroidery. And I, I had a gut reaction that this probably isn't good. So over the years, I mean, that must have been at least 10 years ago. And now we really have been ingrained in the stowaway society that we have. My job right now in my business is to find and, and really get away from that. I'm looking for quality products. I'm looking for companies who have standards of excellence and what they do, how they source their products, um, how they make their products. Are they making it in the United States or are they making it overseas and shipping it over? So for me, that's definitely one of the things I am searching for and I incorporate in my business. One of the companies I carry, they source all of their wood for their furniture um, in plantation grown trees oh. from the US. Wow. So it's not about deforesting overseas and shipping it all on a barge wow. here. And so for me, they're gonna be one of my go-to companies because not only do they do that, they also um, give back to the community and they have an academy, they call it, wow. to help young people learn the craft and the way they make their furniture the stories behind the company. I'm all about that now. I really, really like it. And quite frankly, I think it's time to get back to that. I think it's time to support US manufacturing. And I think it's time to look for quality in our products. Maybe not throw it away so quickly. Maybe spend a little bit more money on a product. So now, you know, maybe it will last a little longer. So I just feel all of that is a definition of quality. I think that's so incredible too, the fact that if you can find those companies that are ethically sourcing their mm -hmm. materials, and if that's something that you do care about, uh, being able to make the investment in those companies. And I think the more we get educated about mm -hmm. these kind of issues and the more that we find out about them, the more people will start caring and then the more we can mm -hmm. invest our money in these kind of products and in those companies that are making steps in those things that we care about. So, mm -hmm. and it's, you know, in furniture, in products for our home, in food, in, in all different sectors. But mm -hmm. when it comes to this kind of stuff, yeah, in a company that, wow, has a set, <laughs> like a tree farm that they grow, I don't know, I forget what you said, plantation? Right, plantation That, that they grow here in America, that they don't have to ship wood. I mean, that's incredible. It is. And the more people can get educated about that, mm -hmm. then they can make smarter purchases. Absolutely, yeah. Smarter purchases, that's exactly what it's all about. That's absolutely mm -hmm. incredible. So let's talk a little bit more about um, some things that, so we talked a little bit about what happened, but let's talk a, li a little bit about getting back to products that are about quality. Um, what are some things that you think people can look for when they wanna make a, a, a big purchase or even a small purchase for their home when they're looking for quality in design? Well, again, like, like I said, number one, you wanna find out where the product is manufactured. Uh, if they're looking for a sofa, is it manufactured in, in um, the United States? So, for instance, the company I'm talking about, not only do they make it here and grow the, you know, have the wood purchased from the United States, they also do all of their jewelry for the, for the furniture oh, wow. from all over the country, but within the country. So they may get their nail heads from California. They may get the ferals, uh, the jewelry on the feet from Rhode Island. They have cotton springs and from the south. So that's one of the things you, you should ask for. Find out where it's manufactured. Find out if it's made in the United States. Next thing you want to talk about or ask about is how it's made. Is it eight-way hand-tied? Are the straps attached to the frame? How is the frame made? What is the frame made of? 
those are the things that will be important in a large purchase. Yes. So that's furniture. As far as, um, say, window treatments, for instance. So I do a lot of window treatments. And over the years, I've developed my standards of excellence of how I have my workroom make window treatments. They use certain lining. They use certain fullness. They make things by my standards, not theirs. I tell them what I want. If they're applying a decorative trim, I want the back to look as nice as the front. If, I, if it's reupholstery, they need to be meticulous. So all of these things create a company that has standards of excellence. That's incredible. And Robin knows her stuff. <laughs> you couldn't tell. <laughs> I'm just sitting here thinking like, yeah, Robin knows. Robin knows what she's doing. She knows. Um, and and I, I mean, I just think it's incredible, this company that you're talking about. They even have an academy for young people, like you said, um, for people coming up and teaching others. When you're looking and you're asking these questions, is it almost kind of a, uh, a, a red flag if a company either can't an answer your questions or won't answer your questions on no. where products made or where they source their materials from or what if you, you know you have questions and they just simply won't answer well if they simply won't answer I'd turn around and walk away um, what I would do is first things first if you really are interested is it made in the United States we have to support U.S. manufacturers and artisans. We just have to. It's very important. We're talking about trade wars every day oh, and geez. all of that. And you know what? It's time we support American manufacturers. So I would start with that. Ask them, is it manufactured in the United States? And if the answer is yes, okay. How is it manufactured? What goes into the materials? If they don't know it, I'm sure a responsible um, salesperson or company will find out if they don't know it. If they just kind of, you know, push it away and, and go on to another subject, make sure they understand, look, this is what I'm looking for in a product. So be firm and right out, right out front, just say what you're looking for. I'm looking for the United States. I want to know how it's made. I'd like to know how it's sourced. If you can find out all those things for me, then you know we may be able to do business here. Then we may be able to do business. Mm -hmm. uh, OK, let's talk a little bit about how we uh, perceive our purchases and how we decide you know, what's important to us and what we want to put into our home. Well, I think to. Um, if you really want quality products in your home, then wait until you can actually do the products in your home. So if you're going to move forward with this concept, say to yourself, okay, you know what? I really like this idea. I'm gonna purchase a piece of art. I may, it may take several months to save up for it, but you're gonna save up for it and then go buy it. You're gonna save up for a beautiful sofa or a well-made chair or hand-turned bed. Oh. And when you go to purchase it, you will have had the experience, okay, I saved up for this. Now I wanna know everything about it. And it's, it, it's fun, it's nice, it's nice to know. And you bring it home, you have a piece of furniture, a nice piece of artwork that will last and also you might actually be able to hand it down to your kids like they used to do. And it's not always what's trendy and what's um, throwaway and what's uh, cheap. It's something you can enjoy for a very long time. I think that's so true. Um, that, what was it? I think it was like an autumn. Um what do you, do you call it an ottoman? an ottoman? I can't think. Okay, that piece that you posted, yeah. I mean, it was almost a statement piece. It mm -hmm. was beautiful. So looking, and we talk about this a lot when you're here, Robin, is finding something that speaks to you, that you love and you cherish, So and, and saving up for that so that when you find something, you see it if you, you can actually get it. So whether it's a piece of art or a furniture, a piece of furniture, or, you know, those window treatments that you fall in love yeah. with, you can actually get that. Um, so it's always fun to be able to talk to you about that. If you don't know what I'm talking about, Robin posted along with that uh, picture of that home you were working on <laughs> <laughs> over the weekend, this beautiful ottoman. And I was just like, now I want that. <laughs> but yeah. finding those true pieces that you love, quality pieces, 
I mean, that thing is beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> and um, that was from a designer Gorgeous. in from Arkansas. Gorgeous. And she's from, uh, you know, a little town in Arkansas, and she does some beautiful things. Her name's Toby Fairley. And I, I just, I thought that was an amazing piece, Gorgeous. and I had to have it in that home. So we had done a big photo shoot in that home um, on Friday. So that's why you saw the pictures that you did, yeah. Well, thank you for sharing. Yes, because, thank you. Oh, my goodness. Uh, so Robin Garceau, we're talking about quality in design, and she has a couple presentations, uh, workshops, events, classes, and all that good stuff coming up. So, of course, you can find all of that information and much more on her website, Robin Garceau Interiors. We'll have a link to that uh, and the event coming up at the Providence Art Club later on this month. So, Robin, thanks so much for joining us today. You're welcome. Always a pleasure. We're going to get set up here for our next guest on Go Local Live, so please hang tight. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us here on Go Local Live with the Navigant Credit Union Broadcast Center. I'd like to say hello and welcome to the Providence Athenaeum Executive Director, Matt Barisi. Thanks so much for joining us, Matt. Thanks for having me. So, very exciting news coming out of the Providence Athenaeum. A couple pieces of exciting news. Uh, let's start off by talking about your special and rare collections. Not only do you have them, but you're adding to them thanks to um, a generous donation. Let's talk a little bit about what the spare, the special and rare collections are, just to give people a heads up on what that is, uh, and then we'll go from there. Sure. So the Providence Athenaeum is uh, one of the great uh, things about our collection is our special collections. Uh, we specialize in natural history, travel and exploration, old fiction, and old children's literature as well. So, for instance, in the old fiction and, and poetry, we have uh, a first edition, Leaves of Grass, that's hand-inscribed by Walt Whitman, wow. that we paid $1.25 for. Um, and we have a first edition, Raven and Other Poems, and a first edition, Moby Dick, and those sorts of things. Oh, just absolutely incredible. And what treasures, not only to America, American literature, and, and but now we have them here. Well, we've had them here in Providence. Um, so let's talk a little bit, but those are special and in the rare collections. But... You have added to the collection and now able to share that on display in um, in something new that in a new uh, exhibit that just launched a couple days ago. Yes, so I would encourage everybody to come to our uh, special exhibit that's on display now. It's uh, in conjunction with RISD's Nature Lab, and uh, what we have on display uh, that's very special to us are three plates that were cut from the uh, description of Egypt, which is one of the treasures of our collection. Uh, the Description of Egypt is a 25-volume set that was commissioned by Napoleon Bonaparte himself. Uh, it was, uh, was done over about 10 years. It's a magnificent piece. Uh, and we have 25 volumes uh, of this book, but sometime in the early 20th century, there were, three, uh, there were 14 plates removed from the books. And now we're, because we have a very special gift that's just been made to the Athenaeum, we're now able to restore that, hopefully. 
So this is pretty incredible. So you had some pieces of the collection. And so when you received this gift, talk, talk to us a little bit about what went into the decision making. You were like, this, we want to finish this as much as possible, or, or what went into the decision making? Sure. So I should mention first that uh, the Athenaeum is very fortunate to receive a, a very special gift from, from a, a loyal, anonymous couple that's been connected with the Athenaeum, has made a $100,000 gift to, towards building and developing the special collections. The Athenaeum historically has not been able to go out and actually proactively purchase things for the special collections. Most of the things that are in our collections were either bought by the proprietors or we've inherited them uh, from our earlier library or uh, people have left them to us. Uh, but we've never been able to actually go out and purchase things. So when we received this gift, the first thing that came to mind was, well, we have the vast majority of this, but we're missing these 14 pages. We'd like to get them back. Okay, so that was, it was kind of at the top of the priority list to try to hone in on this collection. I'm just yes. gonna have you squeeze over a little bit. Uh, and I just think this is so fascinating. And so what you have acquired, uh, three plates are now on view, Observing Nature, the Edna Lawrence and Cabinets of Curiosity exhibition is on display now through June 17th. So you have the opportunity to come in and see part of this collection, which is a really neat opportunity because again, just acquired. Yes, yeah, you can see it. You can be the, some of the first people to see it. So come on down. So this is, like you said, a pretty excellent opportunity because the Athenaeum hasn't really had the opportunity to just go out and acquire things. Um, are there more opportunities now to keep looking or what kind of comes next? Absolutely. So we're talking about it. This is a, this is a really transformative gift for the Athenaeum because it yeah. allows us to really think about, well, you know, we can't go out and buy a Picasso tomorrow, but we can think about what we want to add and be very strategic about it. And I know we have some very big plans. Well, that's exciting news. But I can't share. I mean, are any like any hints? Is there anything? Well, that's the kind of thing. I mean, obviously, you can't give out full details, and this was um, this was a big step for you all. But I mean, when we're talking about rare and special collections, uh, let's talk about kind of the mind frame and preserving what you do have. Yeah, so the gift does allow us also to, to make some important preservation and conservation investments. Uh, the Athenaeum is, a, we have 180,000 volumes in our collection. Some of them are quite old, but while all of them need conserving and preserving. So uh, this gift will also allow us to help uh, conserve and preserve some of our collection. So let's talk about how the Athenaeum does go about that, or in the process of even uh, acquiring new things, you know, dreams, goals, big things. <laughs> what would you like to see? Um, we've talked, I think, last time you were in here about the humanities. Uh, you know, you don't have to say what's in the works or what's not in the works, but what would you like to see brought into Providence, or how could we go about making, whether it's special collections or not, making that better for Providence? Well, I think that the Athenaeum, um, <clears throat> I think one thing we have to do is make sure that we recognize the legacy of everybody who's contributed to the Athenaeum, including women. If you walk into the Athenaeum, you're going to see a lot of old dead white guys. <laughs> I love dead white guys, but uh, maybe we could have a dead white woman in there, uh, you know, something like that. Uh, so that's some of the things we want to honor the legacy of uh, all the people who are involved in the Athenaeum, because it's really a community uh, uh, effort there. No, I definitely think so. And I think probably now, um, 2017, 2018, we've seen a lot of progress in a lot of ways. So looking back in history and showing there were other contributors besides yes. those dead white men. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And you do a ton of programming at the Athenaeum, um, bringing in many different people from many different perspectives. So I think that's always nice to incorporate programming with exhibits as well. And you all do a fantastic job of that. Thank you very much. Um, let's talk a little bit about some other exciting stuff happening at the Athenaeum. Um, this is pretty cool. You may have noticed a beautiful fountain out in front of the Athenaeum. You have some good news about the fountain as well. I do. Thanks to the generous contributions of two donors, we've been able to restore the fountain to operation. And it hasn't run in more than a decade. And uh, on May 20th, from 2 to 4, we'll be having a garden party. All are welcome. You can sign up at our website. and. Well, you can see the fountain flow again, and it's a very important piece of Providence history. Uh, that fountain is actually one of the first drinking fountains in Providence, and one of the first in the country, actually, that was installed. This is so cool. I guess I knew that it was a beautiful piece of history of Rhode Island and of Providence, but I guess I didn't know really the actual history behind it. Can you talk to us a little bit about 
what a drinking fountain was and how important historically this this fountain and getting the movement of water back into it really means for the city. Uh, it means a lot because w I should say when the, when the Athenaeum was founded in 1838 uh, at the opening remarks, Francis Whalen said, we mean here to open a fountain of living water at which the intellectual thirst of the community may be slaked. And 35 years later, uh, Anna Richmond made us a gift to put a drinking fountain in. At the, at the time, clean drinking water was hard to come by, actually. And uh, some of the people, there was a cholera epidemic, and that was the movement behind uh, public drinking, public municipal water systems. So providing this was a part of preventing disease, and also it was a part of the temperance movement to stop people from drinking. I'm not sure how well that worked. Uh, because it was a sort of an alternative to drinking booze, but people would drink a lot because drink a lot of alcohol because it was safe to drink alcohol rather than the water, which might get you sick. So this is not only this is a symbolic gesture, as well as an important historical gesture as well. Um, something else that I thought was pretty interesting was that um, the 19th century legend that once you drink it, you're destined to return to Providence. Can yes. you talk a little bit about that? There That's is fascinating. This, this legend does exist. So and Rhode many, Island. Yeah, it is very Rhode Island. A lot of people have uh, come to me and told me this story that if you drink from the fountain, it is said that you will always return to Providence. Uh, so, so come and drink from the fountain and never leave. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so Rhode Island. I love it. And I totally believe it. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about what it was like for you to, uh, for the Athenaeum to get this up and running once again? What it was like for you, were there any hurdles to jump over or jump through? <laughs> yes. I've learned more about restoring fountains to operation <laughs> than I ever wanted to know. It was actually quite extensive. We had to dig up the street in front of it. We had to re uh, it was very extensive. It took a long time, actually. When I first got there to the Athenaeum in 2015, I thought, we have to do this. We have to get this fountain running again. And not just because you know, it's ours to take care of, but because I think it really represents a lot about what the Athenaeum values, which is this this thing that's for the community, that's for everybody, that uh, that that if you want to come and, and be refreshed, this is how you, this is where you can come to do it. So it was important for that reason. Um, as far as the actual work goes, it was a lot of work, <laughs> and uh, uh, so, uh, better than better men than me helped uh, restore that thing to operation. I will say we had good help from our friends at Malone Plumbing. They really did a lot of good work there. So shout out there. I think that's excellent. And I think what a neat movement going forward as we head into spring and hopefully it will be into, hopefully we will feel like spring by then. So the garden party is Sunday, May 20th from two to four. It's also an open house. So you can come, uh, going to be some music there as well. Uh, and some tours as well as activities for kids. Yep, we're gonna have tours and bring the kids. There's gonna be stuff for them to do. We'll have, I think, cucumber sandwiches and Prosecco, it'll be great. This is an incredible opportunity if you haven't visited the Athenaeum to come take a peek in as well. Um, I'm curious to know, as we're continuing through spring and working our way into summer, what are things like as the weather gets nicer, maybe people aren't as curious to be snuggled up indoors as much. What's summer like in the Athenaeum? So the Athenaeum, usually in the summer, um, around August, we close for a couple of weeks for major repairs to the building. We may be closed a little bit longer because we'll be replacing our roofs this year, which is very exciting. Um, but uh, yeah, it does slow down in the summer. There's not as much programming going on between July and August, but then we ramp back up again in September. And, you, and get things up and running for the September fall fall time. Um, talk to us a little bit about what your goals are. Obviously, some major things happening with this bear, but I'm just combining special and rare today. Just those two words are going together for me today. Um, big things happening for you as well as the fountain. Can you talk to us a little bit about goals as we move forward for the rest of 2018? Sure. Well, we've continued to see strong membership growth at the Athenaeum, so that's very encouraging because we want to have more people using the Athenaeum, more people experiencing our programs. We've been able to put all our programs online for the first time, which Sorry. is very exciting. And really, we're building a really wonderful schedule of events at yeah. the Athenaeum. So we have world-class authors and historians coming in all the time. Uh, and also, we just had an event Friday in conjunction with RISD's Nature Lab about the exhibit. Uh, so we really have just world-class programming, and we really want to keep that up. And again, if you're interested in any of those events, you can check out their website. It seems like every event that I go and look at, it's always sold out, which we is incredible. Every single event we've done this year is sold out. So probably continuing on that path for those goals. Right? Yes, that would be a good goal. That'd be a good problem to have. <laughs> it is. It seems to be a good problem. Uh, I, I always find it interesting, too, as well, to see who you're bringing in, who you're making those connections with. And I believe, Matt, last time that you were in here, that we did speak about the communities and making sure that people have access to, to different, whether it's 
whether it's a famous architecture that's coming in or a musician or an author uh, and talking about the humanities why do you think that's important as we move forward in 2018 I think the humanities are really important to the public discourse. I think that we have denigrated them for many years, and I think it's been to the, dis the, the detriment of the country. I think that enlightened conversation is really going to help us move forward as a country. So I believe the humanities are central to that, and the founders believe that as well. Exactly. Um, as we wrap up here, uh, uh, moving forward here on Go Local Live, what else do you think people should know about the Athenaeum? Maybe they've been a longtime supporter, maybe they've visited several times, or maybe they've just driven by and they're like, hmm, I wonder what that building is. Well, Eddie, you could always just come in the Athenaeum. You don't need to be a member. You can just walk right in. I know the exterior can be a little imposing, but you don't have to be a member. You can come in. Somebody will greet you. They'll show you around. It's a wonderful place to just come and see. If you've never seen it, you should come and see it. Just come head in for a visit uh, before the 20th and then, of course, on the 20th of May as well to celebrate the restoring of the fountain that apparently was hard to get up and running. <laughs> but we're a little so, harder than I thought. But. We're so glad you did. <laughs> All right, Matt, well, thank you so much for joining us here. Check out the Providence Athenaeum. Thank you again for the wonderful continued programming. Thank you very much. All right, we're going to take a break here and set up for our next guest on Go Local Live. Thanks so much for joining us. Please hang tight.
Hey everyone, thanks for joining us here on Go Local Live in the Navigant Credit Union Broadcast Center. I'm joined with Caroline Bruno from the Wheeler School. She's the co-chair of the 70th annual Wheeler, famous Wheeler clothing and more sale. 70 years, this thing is huge. Caroline, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Yes, this is our 70th year. It's, it's fantastic and so far we have more stuff than I've seen in all the years I've been involved. It's we're trying to get out of the stuff right now. It's fantastic. We oh my gosh. Ask for more. That's incredible. How long have you been involved in the clothing and more sales? I have been involved four years. This is my fourth year at the school and as a new parent it's one of the best activities you could get involved in because you get thrown right in and you meet people right away and it's so it's been fantastic to way to meet people. Now I'm running the, sh the sale so I have to be careful about volunteering. <laughs> you have to be careful because you'll get in. roped into being but in it's charge. Great. It's one of the best ways to meet parents and as your kids get older, I have two high schoolers, you know, you don't, you're not on the playground with the kids as much anymore so it's nice to meet parents, you know, from different grades and different experiences, talk about colleges and all the things that are ahead that your high schoolers don't tell you. <laughs> all the secrets that you don't know about, maybe you don't want to know about. No, that's good. Uh, talking about colleges and whatnot. So let's talk a little bit about the sale. If you don't know, again, the 70th year for the famous Wheeler clothing and more sale, and we always have to make sure we get that more in there because there's so much more than the clothing. But let's talk a little bit about the event. It, like you said, it's huge. And like you said, there's more than you've ever seen. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, April 12th, 13th, and 14th. We'll, of course, put the days on there. The times are a little bit different, so we'll link to the website at the Wheeler School and then um, the page as well. But talk to us a little bit about what people can expect to see when they walk in. I mean, you fill up the gym with just about everything. We do. It's kind of a pop-up savers, pop-up yard sale. We have a housewares department which has linens, baby gear, frames, pictures, rugs, luggage, glassware. Um, I did bring this wonderful teapot. It's a Beautiful. Nombre teapot, which is a Southwest brand. Um, you know, stainless steel, really nice custom teapot that someone donated from a specialty place in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, there's glassware, you know, if you love the old crystal that your grandmother had, or a tea set, or plates, Christmas decorations, you name it, that's housewares, and you can find a ton of things. Then there's a boutique section, which has high-end Armani, you know, designer stuff. Wow. We did bring a pair of Dior shoes, which are practically like brand new. new. Jeez. <laughs> yes, we have those, this Palazzi little purse. Um, this is a Gucci scarf that somebody donated. So and these are just a few of the things that we have um, in the boutique section. Then we have a books and toys department, which pretty much what it says, books, <laughs> but any range of children's books to gardening books, cookbooks, self-help books, you name it, there's all the books. Um, and toys, puzzles, games, Legos, any kind of toy. Then there's the sporting goods department, which has ice skates, lacrosse sticks, pool toys, life jackets, bicycles is a big seller. Um, and we have a lot of nice bikes this year. You know, some people donate really nice bikes that their kids have just outgrown. Um, you know, there's Patriots shirts. And this year we actually have an autographed Jarvis Green Super Bowl awesome. champion Patriots jersey. So there's any that sort of stuff. And if your child is just starting lacrosse and you don't want to invest in all of the equipment you can buy a lacrosse stick and you know they can try it out there's men's department which has all the usual men's things and there's the regular floor which has kids clothes women's clothes oh and the, of course there's accessories so there's purses scarves jewelry you know and there's some nice jewelry and there's the costume jewelry and there's something your little girl might like to wear too so you're not going to feel too bad about if someone wants a little something, you say, oh, sure, here's a little necklace you can have. And if they lose it on the playground, you won't be too upset. You won't be too upset. And that's what I think is so fascinating about this. And so amazing is that people give and give and give. And it's done so well that it's gone on for 70 years, which I think is so special. And you can find treasures. And like you said, these, these Dior shoes, if you see the bottom, it looks like they've barely ever been worn. Um, looks like you brought some gadgets as well. We have a sweater behind us that still has the tag on, so you can find 
Uh, you can find new products, you can find just slightly used products, like you said, the bicycles and everything. So this is a fantastic event. Uh, and what I think it also is cool about this event is not only can you find a bargain uh, and some things that you might not have ever have thought about, uh, but proceeds go to some special groups as well, not only the Wheeler School, but uh, benefit to other programs as well. Right, Breakthrough Providence is a program we've supported with our clothing sale. It is a program for underprivileged middle school children who want to succeed in high school. So there's a during the year, they come once a week and you know get some help with their homework so they can become better students. And then there's a summer program. I think it goes all summer long, and we help contribute to that. So it's a great helps our community, helps the Providence community, and you know it's a nice way to have people recycle their goods and make money for the school and for the community. So I think that's great. yeah. I think that's incredible to be able to help. Um, support the community in any way. So we've talked about some of the fun stuff that you can find, some of the designer things that you can find, some great stuff. You, you mentioned, of course, yeah, if your kid's just getting into lacrosse, don't go out and spend so much money, you know, get something that maybe some other kid has tried their luck with, right. oh, which yeah. I think is cool. Um, it's always fun to hear what people donate <laughs> oh. <laughs> because maybe not everything can be uh, reused or you know it cannot be upcycled can you talk about some unusual items that you've found at the sale or maybe special items well I do know one of I think the best is inside of an old coat pocket we did find a pair of dentures one time <laughs> so we certainly weren't going to resale those of course <laughs> um, you know you find sometimes we even were lucky enough to find money you know we have a lucky penny or <laughs> even an extra 20 you forgot in your summer shorts that you passed on and that also goes you know right to the we'd make early sales before we've even opened our doors um, and I know last year someone bought from the housewares department a small silver teapot and you know they got it for five dollars ended up it was a very valuable oh. piece of silver so you know sometimes you find a gem Sometimes we also have a parent who works in that field and they evaluate oh, cool. things. So if we come across, you know, a very special item, kind of antique roadshow-ish, you know, we will sell that in a different venue so that it makes more money for the school if it was a special antique. Um, I know there was, we have some prints from some somewhat famous artists that, you know, you might, if you're an art history person, you know, American art history type things, we have that. Um, you know, it's I think that's I think that's so incredible, and it's always fun to to be able to hear what you come across, and then also what you can find because treasures can also definitely be found. Um, and what I think it's neat too is how you're able to fill up the space. Like you said, you're kind of swimming in stuff right now, but the goal is really to be able to to be done with everything. What happens at the end of this? You've been involved for uh, for four years, but you have this huge gymnasium. What happens at the end of three days? Well, we hope to sell as much as we can, <laughs> and obviously as the days go on, the prices get a little lower, <laughs> and there is some, you know, blowout clearances at the, you know, the last few hours. And then once all the paying customers have gone, we do have charities that come in, and they're allowed to fill up their bags and take whatever they want, and then Whatever's less left, we do have savers or epilepsy company come and pick up the whatever's left. So nothing is thrown out. It is all used. So that's, you know, it's great. We try and sell as much as we can, and hopefully we don't have much left at all. That's wonderful. And it seems like every year it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Are there, the, are there any goals for this year? Well, <laughs> you no. Know, I mean, we're just trying to sell as much as we can and each year you know as I've been involved you find a better way of doing it how to hang the pants I know we've scouted out savers and we found hanging the men's pants on their side oh. saves space and people can see the size tags a little better so that's one you know we're always looking to improve and we have parents who've worked in marketing or merchandising and they come up with better ways to put things out there or you know better ways to package we collect the stuff from September until December and we store it so we've now learned how to package our storage pod so that it is perfectly packed like a jigsaw puzzle and this year we found 
we had a ton of stuff, you know, more than we had last year that we were able to store it in there just right so it, we were able to have more stuff. That's incredible. Is there anything special happening this, now that this is the 70th year? Are there any special celebrations or anything planned for the 70th year? Well, we hope to come up with some sort of marketing special, whether it be, you know, 70 items you might be able to do something, or every 70 minutes we might have a special on shirts or shoes, something along those. We're still brainstorming some ideas, but we have, we've tried to do some of the marketing kind of 70-ish to, you know, play on the 70s generation and the 70th anniversary. So, you know, it's great that, you know, we've been able to start it off with the Wheeler parents, there were uniforms at the time, and so it started with the Wheeler parents trying to have an exchange for uniforms because they were expensive and you wanted to, you know, pass your uniform on to someone else who might need it. So that's how it started all those years ago, and now it's turned into, you know. Everything. <laughs> everything that, you know, people can reuse or, you know, one man's treasure, one man's trash is another man's treasure, and so it's always something you don't have a use for. Someone else might be just hitting that phase of their life and be able to use it. Absolutely incredible. So if you're interested, uh, again, the dates for the famous Wheeler Clothing and More sale is happening Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, April 12th, 13th, and 14th. Um, all t hours kind of ranging, but starting either at 10 or noon and lasting until about 8 o'clock, the last day wrapping up at 3 o'clock. And we'll put details again on our website with links as well. So Caroline, thanks so much for joining us today. So much fun chatting with you. Thanks. Can't wait to do a little shopping. Oh yeah, please do. Thanks for having me. And everyone, come on down. It's a great You'll love it, and once you come, you'll want to come back every year. It's a great, a great sale. Definitely want to mark it down on the calendar. So thanks so much for joining us. We're wrapping up here in the Navigant Credit Union Broadcast Center on Go Local Live. For this hour, Josh Fenton kicks things off starting at 4 o'clock with All Things News and Business on Business Monday, sponsored by Deepwater Wind. I'm Molly O'Brien. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you online.